Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? I am doing well. I'm doing well. Coming off of, uh, you know, hi, Easter weekend was super fun for us. Um, you Tell know, me. Uh, yeah, ate a lot of food, uh, ate a lot of the things that I was supposed to give up for Lent. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I gave up, uh, my wife and I typically will give up sweets for Lent. Uh, and that tends to, that strategy, or at least that sacrifice tends to bend a little bit towards the end. <laughs> but uh, We went all in. Uh, and then this year, I also gave up bread, which was a lot harder than I expected. Because uh, even though I don't regularly eat sandwiches, all I wanted when I gave up bread was a sandwich. <laughs> well, that resonates. I uh, am not a particularly religious person, but I am uh, Jewish. And so we give up bread for Passover. I'm not very good at that part of it. <laughs> I have trouble getting by without bread. Well, it, it's interesting. Uh, I was talking about, I guess I was lamenting my Lenten sacrifices during clinic one day and uh, Jamie Findice, the therapist that's in clinic with me on Fridays, she was like, well, but is giving these things up actually making you a better person? And I'm like, no, clearly not. I'm hangry. I really <laughs> need a sugar fix right now. <laughs> Maybe I need to reconsider my strategies here. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny when you talk about giving up sweets. I mean, that that's another one that's very hard for me. It, it's interesting how our family divides. Um, my wife is really disciplined. Um, and my two older kids are really disciplined as far as eating. And not to pick on my youngest child, but my youngest child follows my path, which is pretty good most of the time. But put some Nestle crunches and some uh, M&Ms in the cabinet and they will not last long. Oh man. So I had a, I had a patient, a grateful patient who expressed her gratitude in the best way, obviously bringing in food. Uh, and she, um, had a family, I'll just try to leave it very generic. She had a family member who works for uh, a very big candy company comes in just with, looks like she was about to rob a bank with these two huge sacks, uh, of, you know, candy branded swag. And of course, inside it is literally the most candy I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask before you tell did you share it with everyone in clinic and accept that you're not taking any of this home did you did you hide it away to take most of it home or did you do a, a kind of partial i did neither of those two chuck <laughs> what'd you do so did my you? whole thing my thing is that if somebody brings something into clinic to show how thankful they are if there's any possible way to bring that home to show my children that i helped somebody and that they were so thoughtful and appreciative that they did something for me i kind of want them to see that because i want them to understand that you know we're not completely transactional in this world uh, in the sense that you know you pay x and you get y but people just think of you and they appreciate you when they will do something nice. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to bring home the candy. But <laughs> <laughs> so no, wait, the, bags, the, bag, the bags were cool. So I brought home the bags, immediately showed them the bags and what was inside of them, and then dumped all of the candy into a separate bag, which is stashed in the laundry room. May have gotten into the stash recently. But I will admit to one thing that I did. Now, I know there's a whole line of questioning that's coming my way on this, but I admit to one thing that I did very weak of me. Before I took the bags home, I went and picked up all the peanut butter M&Ms and put them in my stash in the clinic, knowing there would be a day where I would just need a whole lot of peanut butter M&Ms. You got to do what you got to do. But I, I, you know what? Um, this is a great topic. Uh, I think most of our listeners can uh, relate. Um, it is really appreciated when patients do think of us in a non-transactional way. And it happens some, um, I'm pretty, you know, my clinic style is pretty direct. Uh, I can be warm and fuzzy, especially with the pediatric population, but I'm not always the most warm and fuzzy. You know that about me. And I know patients get that and either you like that and, or you don't. Um, there's benefits running on time, et cetera. But what patients do recognize and bring in gifts on occasion. I don't get um, gifts all the time, but when I do there, I'm grateful. I usually share them with the staff or just give them to the staff. I do agree with you, though. It is important. It's important to, for our kids and family to understand these these signs of appreciation. Yeah, there are many there are many things that uh, I will share with our team. Um, it's giving, not chocolate. 
<laughs> well, no, no, there was there was chocolate distributed, uh, but I really wanted them to, to the bags were really cool. So, <laughs> and of course, you can't just bring home one bag if you have two. I mean, I guess I could. I should probably teach my kids a lesson in sharing. Uh, but clearly, I haven't learned it either. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. One of the um, so patients will bring stuff in. And one of our team members who shall remain nameless has a total thing about eating stuff that patients bring in that is homemade. Will not touch it, uh, which I kind of get, uh, but I'm also a sucker. <laughs> I, will, I will go for it. Do you have any strong feelings? I, I, honestly, it depends a little on the patient. Uh, I'm, I'm judgy in that way. Uh, but, you know, I think our therapy colleagues uh, will, uh, this will resonate with them because if, if your therapy practice is anything like the therapy practices that I see in uh, surrounding my practice, the therapists get all the good stuff. The therapists get all the good stuff and rightfully so, because y'all spend so much time with patients. Uh, but I think I get, you talk about getting a few things. I'm like you, I'm not that warm and fuzzy. Um, my soft spot is not peds, but it's the nerve patients. I spend a lot of time with them and do all of that. Um, but I am pretty direct in clinic as well. Probably learned it from you. And so I don't get, I get a fraction, literal fraction of the rewards and uh, 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 fun stuff that our therapy colleagues get, which is cool because they earned it. For sure. And, you know, that is for the uh, medical students and residents who are listening. Uh, it's different when, you know, hand surgery is not always life changing. Um, in a way that total joint arthroplasty or spine surgery may be. And uh, if you're in it for the chocolate, maybe you think about those specialties. <laughs> I think that um, spine patients might not be chocolate. I think you're looking for spine surgeons. They may go a little bit, uh, you know, higher tier, so to say. But oh, you never know. Like wine and that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyway, so um, our topic today is sportsy. It's a detailed episode on ECU tendon surgery. Now, I don't have a ton of experience with this because I have chosen not to make sports a big part of my practice, uh, mainly because there's a, a giant elephant in the room that gobbles up all the sports in our group, <laughs> but <laughs> that's totally okay with me. You know, um, I don't know that I gobble it, but I do enjoy it most of the time. It's, it, it, uh, <laughs> What's interesting about the ECU tendon is it falls into the black box of the owner side of the wrist. And I'm actually doing a webinar uh, for the AAOS and Hand Society in, on, in early, early May about the, this topic that is the owner side of the wrist. And, and so people always like to talk about um, the TFCC um, and that's sort of um, you know one of my passions. The ECU gets a little less respect but it shouldn't because it, it can be the culprit. Um, and it's tricky. There's no doubt it's tricky. And I would say that when I think about the ECU, uh, I think about ECU tendonitis and ECU instability. And while they are you know, potentially related, uh, they are separate diagnoses. At least that's the way I think about it. In, in a big picture, do you think about it the same way? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I'm curious, you know, for you of the percentage of young, healthy, active people who have ulnar sided wrist pain. So not ulnar styloid or TFCC related pain after distal radius fracture, but, you know, and in, in a non-fracture setting, what percentage of that ulnar sided wrist pain have um, symptoms that are largely driven by the ECU? Now, I know there's, you know, different kinds of ECU pathology. There's a lot of overlap between ECU and the TFCC and other causes of ulnar side of wrist pain. But what percentage is really driven by the ECU? If we're talking isolated ECU, I would say 5 to max 10%. Um, there, like you said, there's overlap, but uh, it's, a, it's a small percentage. Now, you know, I, you know, it may see me, but I don't always see it is one explanation why it's so low. But I, I think that's 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 feels right to me. But you know, one you know f you know five percent, one out of twenty. I mean, you know, you see a fair number of patients a week. That could be one patient a week that's ECU related. That's maybe exactly more, right. maybe more for, maybe more for you. Yeah, one or two patients a week in some form or fashion. And then it's also complicated by the fact, by two facts, I would say. One, ECU tendonitis is a weird diagnosis 
for me because when I operate for ECU tendonitis, I'm never impressed by the tendonitis, <laughs> meaning I don't see a ton of inflammation. And it's just, it can be one of those procedures that you do that can be helpful, but it's not a procedure I rush to do because I don't always uh, get the satisfaction of that surgery. So that's, that's uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I don't do a lot. Uh, I think I can count on one hand the number of ECU tendonitis surgeries I've done. I spend a lot of time not trying to do surgery uh, for the reasons uh, that you stated. Now, I know we're supposed to do a detail episode um, focusing on technique, but I think it's worthwhile in, for this particular topic to really backpedal and talk about, you know, diagnosis, pearls on history, um, physical exam stuff. And why don't we start with the ECU tendonitis? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we can probably fly through this, I think with full, you know, being fully comprehensive. So, you know, dorsal ulnar pain, I love it when patients say that it radiates up the ulnar side of the dorsal forearm. That is a, a really helpful, um, subjective complaint that I like. Um, other than that, it's that vague area of pain on the ulnar wrist, which can be very difficult to differentiate between other pathologies. And so the, the subjective comment that I like to hear if it's ECU tinnitus is radiating up the forearm. And I would just say that the objective feature is the ECU synergy test. I, and we may have talked about that on the show, but for those of you who haven't done it um, or used it, I should say, it is based on a paper uh, which was written uh, a while back. Uh, it's from 2008. Uh, it's from Robert Ruland and Christopher Hogan uh, in, in uh, Virginia. Um, and they described this test, which makes a lot of sense. And so let me just describe it. Um, it's a supinated elbow bent, 90 degrees, forearm fully supinated. And then the, the idea is you, res you put your... Um, you apply radially directed force on the long finger and ulnarly directed force on the thumbs and, and the thumb. And so the patient is trying to bring their middle finger in an ulnar direction and their thumb in a radial direction. And that requires that you fire ECU. And this paper used, um, used EMG to prove that point. And so when you fire your ECU, um, that should precipitate pain related to tendonitis. And it's a really well done paper. And they looked at three groups of patients. I believe one um, was isolated ECU tendonitis. It got better with injection. Another was coexistent ECU tendonitis and intraarticular pathology. And the third was uh, just intraarticular pathology. And the test stood, stood well, it did well. So supinated, Resisted thumb radial deviation, resisted middle finger ulnar deviation makes you fire your ECU and that should recreate pain. Yeah, no, I, I think that's an excellent summary of it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't usually use the middle finger part of it. I probably should. I have the patient, you know, face their palm towards their face and then I have them spread their thumb as far away as they can from their pinky and I push against them a little bit. And if it causes pain on the ulnar side, that is how I use the test. Um, so I'm not a purist, um, but it seems to work for me in, in terms of at least understanding the involvement of the ECU. Well said, and I totally agree. And part of it is, you know, I'm not calling patients uh, disingenuous, but they don't think about it, right? They're messing with their thumb, not their ulnar sided wrist pain. And so if it really precipitates a strong reaction, then I, I feel like it's great. And then the last thing I'll say is you have to differentiate uh, tendonitis from instability, right? And that, that's really important to do. And you can't effectively treat anyone if you don't know the difference. So before we dive into that, are there any, you mentioned that kind of uh, subjective complaint of pain along the ulnar side of the wrist that radiates up the dorsal ulnar forearm. Are there any maneuvers or activities that patients um, tend to associate or, you know, that you've noticed that they describe, a, you know, as more likely to show up as ECU tendonitis? I think, no, I, I may, and maybe I'm missing something, but I, I think anything that requires you fire your wrist extensors puts that uh, ECU tendon on stretch and can cause pain. So either firing or putting it on stretch can cause pain, but there's not one specific activity like a chair push-up test or, you know, the, nothing like that really helps me isolate the ECU tendon versus ulnar-sided wrist pathology in general. 
So when do your alarm bells start to go off about instability? Is that purely based on your exam or is there anything that comes out of the patient's mouth that makes you think of ECU instability? So first, I think we should clarify that not all instability is pathologic or painful. And so some patients will come in with instability and you notice it as, you know, a kind of happenstance. And that is, should not be over-treated. Um, and I think that's really important. And I recall David Ring uh, talking about that uh, when a, a long time ago when I thought, wow, is that really true? But it is absolutely true. Of course, identifying those that are symptomatic and unstable is important. So the classic maneuver is a good one and it's an easy one. And it's, I don't know if this is the official name, but it's the ice cream scoop maneuver right? So you have your palm pronated and actually your wrist a little bit extended, like you're grabbing an ice cream scooper. And then you go into ulnar deviation and supination and usually a little flexion of the wrist. And if there's instability, that should cause it. And so often you can feel or hear that or see that. It can be subtle for sure. So you have to look for pain or some type of participating symptom. It's not a passive positioning. It's the motion of getting there. And if the patient doesn't walk in and say, this is, what I'm, this is what's happening, this hurts, then you can sometimes get them to show you with that maneuver. So is there any role for blotting or you know, feeling the ECU tendon in different forearm positions and seeing if you can subluxate it? Or is, that, is it purely, like you're saying, an active dynamic kind of test that, uh, um, that has value? Absolutely. And I'd certainly do that. I just think it's... it's most often less clear cut. And so my shifting the ECU tendon out of its groove, first of all, it doesn't always mean anything because you can get an MRI and see the ECU out of its groove. And that doesn't necessarily mean that's the cause of the symptoms. It certainly can be the cause of the symptoms. And you can even get a supinated MRI. You know, most MRIs are done in the Superman position. And so you're pronated, which has relevance for ulnar variants, but also has relevance for the ECU tendon. Is typically a more stable position, but if you supinate the forearm, um, that can put the ECU in a more risk for subluxation position. What else are you looking at on exam? Well, I'm also looking at the fovea and trying to rule out a coexistent TFCC pathology. Um, I'm looking at the carpus as well, and absolutely. You can have, you know, you can have multiple pathologies at once because we know the ECU subsheath is part of the TFCC complex or TFC complex. And we also know that there can be a communication between the two. And so when I think about diagnostic or therapeutic injections, you know, if you're doing an intraarticular injection versus doing an ECU injection, sometimes the medicine crosses and, you know, right. an ECU injection can affect the wrist joint as well. So what's your, uh, what's your workup from there? Um, so say it's a tendonitis patient, no instability on your exam or on their complaints. Are you doing any additional, are you getting any x-rays? Are you doing any imaging? Um, and then how would you, how does that change for an instability patient? Um, if it, if I'm treating tendonitis, I'll do the typical tendonitis things, uh, wrist splint, uh, resting in the position of comfort, which again, should be pronation. I don't, if, if this is an acute onset, I might consider a long arm splint, but generally I do not. Uh, so short arm splint, often custom with a little bit of wrist extension, anti-inflammatories, activity modification with the next, next step being a corticosteroid injection. Um, so no imaging. No, I don't think imaging is helpful. And the reason I don't think imaging is helpful is there can be all types of uh, pathologic appearing things in the ECU. The ECU split, so to speak, is called on MRI all the time. We don't know if that's pathologic or not. It's just going to be, if I'm worried about ECU tendonitis, to me, it's a clinical diagnosis with uh, injection as a confirmatory test and treatment, unless I have to go to the OR, which I try to avoid doing. And then how does, the, how does your treatment change um, for instability? Um, acute onset and in, acute onset instability, um, can often be most effectively managed surgically um, in, the, in, in one population, right? In a population that is, is uh, high level, um, surgery to repair the subsheath might make sense, although you absolutely can also treat them in pronation 
long arm splinter cast and let the sub sheath try to heal. And so it depends on your patient and how aggressive they want to be. I would say that the vast majority of patients who come in are not acute and the instability is chronic, has failed previous treatment, and then you're looking at treatment. And to me, there's two treatment options. And I slash we at this institution favor one, and certainly um, other institutions treat this differently. I'll say that a lot of people like the concept of repairing the subsheath. And to be very clear, there's two parts of what wraps around the ECU. One is the dorsal retinaculum, which comes superficially all the way around volarly. And the, the second part is the what's been termed either the subsheath or the ligamentum jugatum, which is really what holds the ECU stable. So repairing that with or without a deepening of the groove is one option. Uh, I don't love the idea of deepening the groove because to me, it feels like the tendon is just going to scar into place and uh, lose some of its functionality. So what Dr. Government taught me and us is a transposition of the ECU where you take it out of its groove, shift it dorsally, it's free to glide, it's sitting in a beautiful bed over the fifth compartment. And I've been super happy with that procedure. I've written up that procedure with our experience with it. And uh, I think it's a great option, which gives me greater confidence that the ECU will maintain its function. There's a lot to unpack there. We can go <laughs> on for that. That was great. Um, before we dive into the technique parts of that, how, how many injections will you give a patient with tendonitis and no instability? And then is there a role for an injection in a patient with instability? Um, I typically only give one injection. And it is a uh, reflection of uh, a couple of patients that I've seen, thankfully not necessarily been a party to their treatment, where they have received multiple injections in this location, subcutaneous fat atrophy, more pain, and uh, you can also create instability if you inject too many times. And so- Any ruptures? For, I have not seen a rupture. Have you? I have not. Well, not for ECU. I've seen one for FCR. Wow. Yeah, that, that's tough. Um, so I usually only do one. And, and uh, I guess I, I, I will say if patients push me hard because of a great result from a first injection, uh, I might consider a second. Um, do you have a limit? Yeah, I usually won't do more than one uh, based on what I saw with the FCR. And uh, clearly the ECU is a much more important tendon uh, than the FCR. Yeah. Um, I don't know that injection of the ECU for instability is wrong. And I guess if someone was pushing to try it because of a time issue, I might consider it, but it doesn't make sense to me. So I would not certainly not be eager to do that. So let's, let's get to the OR. Um, say you've decided for a tendonitis patient, not instability, uh, you're going to do some kind of debridement or whatever it is that you do for that. <laughs> what do you do? So there are reports that you cut the retinaculum, cut the shove sheath, and everything will be fine. Uh, that's some of the early reports in you know, the general orthopedic literature. I don't believe in that. And so what I typically- a AKA how to create instability? Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> they, the reports say instability was not created, but I, I don't think in good conscience I can, I could do that. Um, what I tend to do is um, essentially take a small area, uh, which would include this, the, the deep ligament or the ligamentum jugatum and work proximal and distal to that. And so I may release the sheath, uh, let's say two centimeters proximal, to the, um, to the tip of the styloid um, and then preserve the sheath over that two centimeters to the tip of the styloid and probably another two centimeters. So maybe preserve three or four centimeters of, for stability, work proximal to that area, open things up, work distal to that area, position the wrist in, in different extension or flexion postures and examine the tendon and debride it as necessary. Uh, that may be conservative, um, but when I've done this, I have found that technique to be effective. And I hope listeners will weigh in if they see it differently or treat it differently. What is considered disease tendon? Well, I mean, by MRI, it's often intrinsic to the tendon, which again is confusing to me. Um, I think we're looking for essentially synovitis around the tendon. I think that's disease like any other tendon. 
Got it. And then after that's done, um, close and that's it. Well, it, it gets to the point of a lot of this close and rest them. You know, it's forced rest for six weeks, which may be, and maybe that's a little punitive, but uh, I think that may provide as much good as the surgical intervention itself. Cast or custom orthosis I or prefab? To, I tend to cast. So they have a lot of, they've invested a lot of their energy and time into it. They want to get better and you're resting them. Sounds like sports. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of like tennis elbow. I don't love treating tennis elbow. I kind of put it in that category. So then talk to me about how you address instability. Um, you know, is this, uh, you mentioned a little bit about your philosophy. Um, you don't like to deepen the groove. I mean, I guess if you're looking for it to scar in and not be unstable, then maybe that's a solution. Um, are there any cases in which you think groove deepening is the answer? Well, I think there are cases where repair of the ligament jugatum is the answer in a truly acute injury. And one of our orthopedic colleagues, not at Wash U, was playing golf, had a pop, had instability, and had a, had a repair two days later. Um, he recognized what he had done, and, uh, and they put two suture anchors in the ulnar border and repaired that ligament or the subsheath back down. And he was kept in a position of you know, pronation and slight wrist extension for six weeks, and he did great. Totally agree with that. Would have done the same. Don't think I would have added a deepening there. Um, I just don't believe in the deepening. I guess if it's a, an old guy like me and you wanted to use that approach, and I probably wouldn't miss my ECU, honestly. Um, but I think in an athlete, whether that be a teenage athlete, collegiate or professional, I think for some, they might. I just don't understand how you're going to get a tendon to glide by a raw bony cancellous surface. I just... <laughs> And, and, you, and you, you immobilize them to boot, right? right? So for that reason, I, I love this transposition procedure. So talk me through the transposition. I think it's technically very straightforward. So you do need a sizable incision. So I don't know, four inches um, going from near the base of the fifth metacarpal, uh, proximal, you know, a bit. And incise through the skin, protecting the cutaneous nerve branches, and release the retinaculum as far volarly as you can. You reflect the retinaculum up. You're looking at the subsheath, which always looks like degenerative tissue. And I release that as far ulnarly as possible. And then examine the tendon. Examine, you know, just take a look at things, try to get a sense of things. Um, and then it's really simple. Once you've mobilized the tendon, you simply bring it dorsally uh, on top of the retinaculum, and then you bring the rest of the retinaculum underneath and then back over the top of the ECU and suture it in place. And uh, you're suturing it directly over the fifth compartment. Um, you have to be careful not to grab the, the EDM, um, but it has a nice bed to rest in. It's a smooth gliding bed. Uh, the retinaculum heals nicely. I typically put at least six, seven, eight st stitches in there. Um, and again, gotten patients back to full activities. I tend to mobilize them for five to six weeks, and then they ramp up from there. What stitches do you use? Like 3 ethabon or something like that? or 3 ethabon, you got it. You know, I, I remember very vividly the description of this procedure in the master's techniques for wrist surgery. Um, obviously edited by Dr. Gelberman, uh, but I, I, as an aside, I picked up a copy of this textbook for like 10 bucks on Amazon when I was a fellow, just because I was, as a fellow, I was running around with my head cut off most of the time. And if I needed to read for something, it had to be like a textbook because I couldn't spend any more time looking for articles. And fortunately, most of the textbooks were edited by our faculty. So <laughs> I picked that one up and I still actually look at that. And it's got a great illustration of this exact procedure. Yeah, and that's where I learned it. And certainly Dr. Gelberman um, was active in the sports field for many years and, and did a great job. And uh, I took his advice and tried it and uh, I've liked it. It is funny about what happens to textbook and pricing because most of the procedures we do in hand surgery, they aren't changing that frequently. I bet most of that book is uh, maybe with the exception of scapulonate treatment. Most of that book's probably spot on today. Well, we know that scapulonate treatment doesn't work anyway, so. <laughs> True. <laughs> True.
Um, any other pearls for ECU, either tendonitis surgery or instability surgery? Anything different that you've, have you changed your surgery over the years? I have not. I have not. Um, I don't think there's any other pearls. I think it's something you have to actively look for, um, meaning the tendonitis or subtle instability. And so making the diagnosis is the hard part. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's the easiest part ever. And sometimes it's the hard part. So you have to think about it versus uh, intrinsic pathology of the wrist joint. And I guess you would say LT would be part of the pathologic spectrum, but um, no, it's, uh, it's an interesting diagnosis. It's not an infrequent diagnosis as we discussed earlier, but I think it's one where we can help patients. Does anybody after a transposition of the ECU, do they ever complain about the appearance of their wrist? Does that lump sitting over the more centrally, does that bother them at all? No, I haven't heard that or honestly seen it. It hasn't ever been uh, totally visible to me. You're just that good of a surgeon. <laughs> the wrist have support and uh, fatty tissue, which hides it. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't ask. All right. Tell me one thing you're grateful for. I am grateful for eating bread and sweets again um, and not feeling bad about it. <laughs> I'm grateful for the, you know, having had uh, the chance to spend some uh, time over the holidays, uh, over the Easter holiday with, uh, with friends and family. And, uh, you know, uh, that is always fun. And I think it should not be taken for granted as much anymore, given everything we've gone through in the last two and two plus years. How about you? Love that. I am grateful that I went to a meeting. I went to the Pediatric Hands Study Group meeting in Salt Lake City, Utah uh, last weekend. Um, it was great to see people. It was great to socialize. It was educational. It was not COVID-free. <laughs> in the end, there was a couple of cases. Um, oh, the old super spreader conference. Nice. <laughs> I don't think it turned into that. We did wear masks because of the rules of the university inside, but with dinner and stuff, we did not. But man, I, I, you know, I've never been someone to say I love meetings and I, I still wouldn't say that, but it really felt good. Was this your first meeting back? I know you've done some like smaller committee meeting and question writing things, but was this first like academic meeting? First academic meeting. Yep. Loved it. How many podcast high fives did you get? I, you know, it's funny you asked that question um, because I know you have said it was great. I, I did get some. And I don't really know what to say. I say, thank you. I'm so glad you're listening. Do you have ideas for topics? But uh, I got a lot. I really did. I really did. And you didn't give away any swag. I forgot to bring swag. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a I'm box, sure, I have a box I'm sure, by my front door. I need to bring some to your house. I'm sure they'll find, I'm sure they're going to find you in Boston at the Hand Society or whatever other, I, oh, we need to bring some to London for the IFSSH. The guys at TSA are, are going to say, what, what are you bringing into our country? The British equivalent of the TSA. And who would want it? <laughs> exactly. They're like, are you guys some kind of fake celebrity? I, I don't understand. All right. Great to see you. Nice seeing you. See you next time. Bye.